Good morning. Welcome to this grab and go session on agile architecture and the role of agile architect. We have around 45 minutes for you guys. If you have any questions throughout, please post them in the chat, then we'll answer them at the end. So let's get into it. We'll talk a bit about the role of an agile architect and how you can best perform there. Then we'll go into the architectural runway and how to use this. And then finally, some strategies to involve and engage your stakeholders as an agile architect. My name is Simon. I work as a consultant here at Deloitte. I work mainly with development teams and architecture teams to help them become more agile. I also teach the Scaled Agile course on architecture to help architects succeed in the world of Scaled Agile. I have a few colleagues as well, Konstantinos and Christina, who you will meet throughout. But the question is, what is Agile architecture? We have a few definitions. Togaf says that it's the structure of components and their interrelations. And the agility is sort of the being able to move quickly and easily. So looking at agile architecture, it's architecture that supports agility, being able to deliver things incrementally, learn from it, and then shift directions if needed. This, of course, sounds very easy, but in practice, it's a bit more difficult. So I asked my colleague Konstantinos um, of his experiences as an Agile architect. We caught him at the IT University of Copenhagen. Hello, my name is Konstantinos Manikas. I am a manager at Deloitte Consulting and I'm also an external lecturer at IT University of Copenhagen. I have around 15 years of experience by developing, designing and implementing software systems and a lot of this time has had a wide focus on the software architecture. Uh, of these systems. So um, the, today I would like to talk a little bit about the challenges that we see in, the, in the architecting these systems, especially when we're looking at architecture at the agile uh, setup. Um, I will try to, uh, to uh, draw some of the uh, uh, slices. I will, I will try to, uh, instead of using slides, I will try to uh, draw uh, some of the problems that, uh, that we typically see uh, when developing systems. So if we have a software system, uh, this uh, system has an architecture. Typically what, uh, what we do is that we identify a number of uh, stakeholders. This is a number of actors that, uh, that uh, will provide input to, to our um, to our architecture and to the design of the system. And these stakeholders typically uh, have a number of uh, concerns. The way that we do this is that, uh, that uh, these um, stakeholders that, that represent what we call uh, the, the business, uh, they provide input to the architecture of our system. Uh, so, so we design our system based on, on their input. Um, at the same time, we have another set of actors in, on the other side. And, and this is the, the development uh, that, that the architecture might, might very well be a part of the, of the development. So, um, so what we do as architects is that we design our system in such a way that the developers take in uh, taking uh, respect for the stakeholders from one side, we design our system in such a way that the developers can develop. So, so this that comes out from our architecture might be uh, system specifications or anything else that, that our um, stakeholders might uh, relate to. When we're looking at the uh, architecture, we, uh, we can separate the architecture in uh, functionality. and qualities. Um, what, that, what that means is that um, <clears throat> functionality is, describes what the system does. So, so, so it describes how the system uh, operates, while the qualities define what the, how uh, does the system um, uh, complete the functionality. So, so the, the functionality uh, uh, describes the what, while the qualities describes the how. Um, 
quality or system qualities are also referred to sometimes as non-functional requirements um, and they represent the overall qualities of the system so for example uh, how uh, fast should the system uh, perform how fast should the system react how available should the system is uh, how uh, easy it is to develop it or how easy it is to modify the system so, so we're talking about performance availability and modifiability but there's also other not necessarily technical qualities so, so how probable it is that we're meeting our time to market requirements or uh, how easy it is to commit to the expected uh, uh, monetary uh, or time budget that, uh, that we have. Um, what has happened with uh, our Agile, um, in, in the Agile development, is that these stakeholders, they, they started being interested more in, uh, in concepts like speed uh, and volume. So, so how can we uh, develop faster uh, and get more value uh, out of our systems? Um, and the development response to this was that they started uh, breaking down software systems into small chunks so uh, of, of functionality right so we started iterating um, we started making an, an iterative development where we deliver functionality in small pieces uh, at a time uh, that has put a challenge in the qualities of the system uh, and that is due to the fact that it is not necessarily possible to break these qualities um, into, into the same chunks. So, uh, so they facilitate uh, the way that, uh, that we uh, provide, the system provides the functionality that, that it should. And, and that is the first uh, challenge. So if we try to formulate the, the first challenge, it has to do with the concept of an upfront versus emerging architecture uh, so so just to just to to take this a little bit uh, a little, little bit more uh, in detail so um so when we are in an agile setup we start breaking down the functionality in in small chunks and we deliver different iterations but the qualities of this iterations they might not fit timely together right so so for example we might have requirements for quality uh, for availability that, that comes further uh, down the line. Um, one of the concepts is that we need to design some of our architecture up front. Um, so, so we need to already have designed a part of our architecture to fulfill some of our qualities. Uh, and another part of our architecture, we let it uh, be uh, uh, developed uh, during our iterations. And this is the concept of an emerging architecture. So, so this challenge primarily focuses on, on what is the minimum amount of architecture that we need to do uh, in an agile setup in order to fulfill the qualities of the upcoming iterations that, uh, that are coming. Um, and the challenge here too many times is lies in the fact that we don't know how our systems are going to be evolved, right? So, so we are unsure what comes in iteration four. Uh, we only know uh, the scope of iteration four when we start our iteration. Um, uh, in order to, uh, to, to facilitate this, there is a concept that is called um, just enough architecture. So, uh, so, so we try to focus on how can we do uh, the minimum amount of, uh, of architecture. If we look at our, our challenge number two, the second challenge, um, when, when these systems uh, start growing in size, uh, the, the, when they're becoming uh, bigger, uh, we might uh, have requirements of having more people uh, working on these systems uh, and it might be the case that we need to uh, to split them up in different teams that work in parallel so uh, so if we have team one and team two and, and team three and they're responsible for for delivering a part of our of our uh, of our functionality it might be the case that they're actually delivering in parallel the challenge here is that uh, uh, we need to facilitate the qualities of parallel development of several teams. Um, uh, that, uh, that creates a coordination uh, challenge. So, so our architecture needs to facilitate for 
the, uh, the infrastructure or supporting the development of all teams, uh, plus the fact that they might actually own uh, part of their architecture uh, and they might evolve their architecture separately. So, so they might have a, their own uh, part of their emerging uh, architecture uh, into this. Um, when we look at the third challenge, we can identify that um, that uh, this part here is is at an operational level, uh, and and it, it is by definition uh, uh, short short term uh, defined. So um, so we can only be sure about what happens in the specific iteration because we renegotiate uh, what is the scope of the functionality for every iteration. So that is actually very. Uh, short term. Of course, we have some more overall goals, uh, but it really depends on the structure of the architecture, on the structure of the agile development, on how much we, we define um, our, our goals and to what level. At the same time, in many organizations, we have the concept of, of de developing uh, more long term strategies uh, and, and roadmaps. Um, so so we, we might have the strategic The, strate the strategic view uh, here that is a, a rather long term, right? So, so when we're looking at at the at this the strategic perspective of uh, of an organization, we we as a minimum look two to five years in front. Um, uh, that creates a, a challenge in in the concept of. Um, of making these two fit together, right? So, so our overall organizational strategy needs to uh, to uh, commit to the operational aspect of the of the um, uh, of the development. So, when moving into this agile approach of architecting, a few things can be seen as fundamental to succeed. We have it needs to be business driven. It needs to be rooted in business and you need to have business ownership of your architecture. You should never do architecture if it's not collect, connected to business features. So make sure to have ownership and connect it to the strategy you have. We have then the distribution of decision power. You need the teams that are working on the systems to be able to do their own decisions, to evolve their own architecture. They know the best. You should only do decisions at the top of hierarchy, if they have widespread consequences or if they're very expensive, if they have great economic impact for the company, then you can take them at the top and make sure that everyone aligns on it. Otherwise, give power to the people and make sure that uh, the system development teams can actually evolve their own architecture and innovate in that sense. Iterative development or agile development goes hand in hand, of course, with agile architecture. If you don't have teams that can deliver incrementally, learn from what they do and sort of take that feedback in, move quickly, then it doesn't make sense to have agile architecture. So make sure you have teams that work in an agile manner and that they keep progressing in their agile journey. Then you have some technology to support your journey. There's a lot of technology out there. Make sure to use it. You have management tools that can help you spot dependencies and you have development tools that can help you in removing the overhead that teams experience, for example, with testing or deployments so that that's done automatically and they can focus on the stuff that matters. And then finally, culture. It's about being agile top to bottom. Uh, architects and business alike need, need to be agile as well. So focus your energy on all levels, on being uh, value driven and actually creating hypotheses and learning from that, and then taking the iterative approach. These are some general points to consider as an organization, um, but as an agile architect, you as a person, how can you actually go about working in this agile setting? I talked to Konstantinos and Christina and asked them a few questions on their experience. Well, working as an architect uh, in the Agile setup depends on where you're actually located in the Agile setup. Uh, if you are located in the solution layer as a solution architect, uh, you're more focused on the entire solution. You're working on guidelines, principles to be used. 
uh, without the rest of the teams um, that are implementing uh, the functionality within the systems. Whereas if you're working within the system implementation as a system architect, you're more focused on the requirements that goes into the system and you're focusing on the system that you have. Um, though that you're focusing on, on, when you're focusing on the functionality that goes into the system as a system architect, um, you are focusing on the functionality that goes into the next iteration, but you need to ensure that the non-functional requirements is already in place to support the functionality. And you also need to look ahead, ensuring that the non-functional requirements that needs, is needed further down the line is also implemented at the right time. Um, and you also need to ensure not just to look at the system that you're responsible for, but also look at to the, the systems that you have dependencies to. Uh, that goes into business processes spanning across multiple systems and that drives integrations between the systems that you actually need to take into consideration and plan and ensure that they are in place for when they are needed. Um, as a system architect, you also need to uh, ensure that you take the guidelines that the solution uh, has provided and take that into uh, the planning of, of the system and, and the work going forward. Uh, typically, it's uh, guidelines from solution that you then takes in. Uh, however, you also need to look at the local constraints that might ensure that, that might dictate that you have to deviate from the general guidelines. Uh, an example could be that solution level has provided integration guidelines that requires that you lock uh, all your data centrally, uh, that all lock files are uh, stored uh, centralized. However, that your local system can have a constraint from the business functionality stating that you are not allowed to do that, that it has to be stored locally and that way you need to deviate um, and that needs to be communicated back to the solution architect to ensure that they know what is going on and then you collaborate from there. The challenges I've seen is that when you have agile teams or have multiple agile teams, the risk is that they work in silos and forget to coordinate uh, across the teams. And that goes both from the functional level, the non-functional levels, but also from a roadmap perspective. Um, I have seen teams and architects who have actually been so focused on their own implementation, their own system, and typically that is on the system level, uh, that they forget the surrounding uh, and sometimes they actually make decisions that is right for their system and their point of view from, from the value chain. However, it might be wrong from other teams in the same value chain and thereby it can actually disrupt uh, the entire solution when it's put together and it doesn't fit together. Um, an example of this is that you can have a system team actually deciding that the way that they want to handle the load or the capacity of a solution is by adding a buffer in front of the system and that way ensuring that they can just keep adding on handling the load as it comes in whereas the other solutions or the systems further down the the value chain actually have chosen to use an agile scaling uh, automated scaling function instead the risk of doing that actually can be that you can have um, bottlenecks in your value chain, but you can also have a negative impact on response time if you do have a requirement that a response comes in and you need to reply back in a certain time. Um, so, so it's actually very important that both from the functional point of view and from the non-functional requirements point of view that you coordinate across and are sure that you are aligned, particularly if there are dependencies between the systems. When engaging the stakeholders, communication is the key, uh, either by involving them, communicating with them, or, or ensuring that you do coordinate various tasks. Um, 
And that goes not only for the stakeholders within the solution that you are actually working with, but you also need to ensure that you incorporate the stakeholders from other parts of the entire solution. It might be the business, it might be the solution architect, it might be a system architect from another uh, team uh, and so forth. Um, and the way I actually have been doing that is to both on, on the system architect level is to participate on system architect sync meetings. Uh, so it's very much through the agile rituals um, where you actually on these meetings do uh, team status, you share information or you take up a topic where you actually discuss uh, as a group and then have a common understanding of it and you know where the deviations are. Um, so that's one area. Another area is actually to participate in the demos both on the team levels, the system level, but also on the solution level in know knowing why, where are the various teams um, in the process. And lastly, it's also important to uh, ensure that you are attending stand-up meetings uh, on a regular basis, not just for one team, but all the teams that you actually have an interaction with. That way you always hear the latest or there's possibility to actually interact with each other at the same time. Um, but I will say the most important ones is actually the more informal meeting that is just ad hoc meetings. That can be a coffee meeting with a stakeholder where you take up a particular topic uh, or you brief them on some certain things um, or you just meet at the coffee machine uh, having a dialogue and something just pop into your mind uh, and then you have the dialogue going from there. So, so communication is the key word. So, um, so if we talk a little bit about how is it like to work as an architect in, in, an, uh, in an agile uh, setup, um, if one doesn't have experience with uh, agile architecture before, so, so uh, uh, one might experience that it uh, takes a lot of time and, uh, and a lot of mental effort to, uh, to uh, predict uh, the evolution, right? So, so sp one spends a lot of time in, in predicting how the systems evolve in order to um, to identify what kind of architectural requirements one should have, right? So, so this relates also to the fact of how much upfront uh, architecture one needs to make, and 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 how much, uh, how 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 big of a, a percentage of your architecture needs to be emergent. So, so what is the minimum amount that one can uh, can do? Um, uh, typically, experience helps. Uh, uh, so, so one becomes better with experience in identifying what are the potential issues that might uh, that might uh, come up and and how one works. So, so uh, uh, one becomes better uh, uh, by by doing this. Our specific focus was uh, was identifying what are the, the tasks for the specific uh, iteration, right? So, so, so focusing on, uh, of course, trying to have an idea of what are we expecting to come in the future, but spending a lot of time in focusing on the specific iteration. Um, we use the principle of uh, of uh, just enough uh, architecture and also just in time architecture, right? So, so, so what what is the minimum amount, as I already said, and then and, and what is timely? What is it needed to be done right now? Uh, but, but also. Also, the, the 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 balancing of of the uh, uh, intentional uh, architecture and, and identifying the necessary enablers so that that are called in in a safe setup, right? So so uh, so what kind of architecture uh, deliverables do we need to have in place in order to support our our functional deliverables in order to, to support what we need to, divide, to de deliver as, as a team or other agile teams, right? So, so what do our agile release trains need to, to have of, uh, of uh, existing uh, architectural design in order to, to do that? Uh, we define this as, as enablers and we created uh, something that is called the architectural roadmap. So, uh, so we uh, try to map uh, both the functional and the qualities, uh, so the functional deliverables and the, the non-functional uh, deliverables that uh, the, our enablers um, and how they are dependent with each other. So, so what kind of uh, deliverables do our agile release trains have and, and, and what kind of enablers are they required to have in place in order to, uh, to, to deliver this?
And of course, we, we spend a lot of time in, in supporting this, right? So, so a big part of our, our work, apart from designing and planning, is, uh, is communicating and, and supporting, right? So, so we spend time being out with the, with the different architects on the trains and, and the Agile uh, engineers, release uh, train engineers, uh, in order to, uh, to uh, identify, first of all, whether our, our design was right, um, and second, how so and, and whether to improve it or not and second how do uh, the different stakeholders need to translate our design and, and what should they make um, out of this if we talk a little bit about the challenges um, uh, if especially if you're coming from a traditional architecture uh, um, way of doing and a traditional architecture practice, uh, there's a number of things that one needs to be aware of. Uh, uh, first of all, it's very important to mention that um, that you don't own your architecture. Uh, you don't own it uh, the same way that you do in a, in a waterfall architecture way or in traditional architecture. Um, the uh, architecture. Uh, is owned by everyone who is using it. Um, so, so we are going away from the traditional ivory tower approach, where where the architects are sitting in the top of their tower and they they only go down to get input and, and communicate what the architecture should do. And we are more into a collaborative and uh, and uh, and and common uh, way of defining architecture. Uh, um, uh, everything is open uh, for input. Everything is uh, is open for being improved, and 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 the architecture itself is being improved by the ones who uh, who use it. Uh, especially when you're sitting at the solution level, you design the the main frame of your architecture, and then you you expect the uh, release trains to uh, follow it and apply it, uh, but but uh, but also come back with ways of improving it. So 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 also evolve your uh, your architecture. At the, at the, at the same time, um, one other aspect that needs to be mentioned is that uh, that one needs to be realistic uh, about the, the the time plan and, and estimations. And that is again, if you're coming from a traditional um, uh, way of architecting, um, uh, in in uh, agile setup, um, coordination and communication is is a big part of your work. Uh, it takes uh, it takes a lot of effort and it takes a lot of time. Uh, so, so, so you should always uh, leave time into um, aligning uh, with the other teams around you, uh, aligning with with the people that uh, that you have interfaces with. A third perspective that that uh, needs to be mentioned here. A third point is that uh, that um, quality is important, and it and it is the same equally important as as it has been uh, in a traditional uh, architecture. So, so the fact that we are uh, 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 we are applying an iterative approach, we are putting less scope, uh, does not mean that we need to compromise our quality. Uh, so we have the same requirements of high quality, but we just focus on on a smaller, even smaller part of our system. And in general. Um, it is it is a, a new brave world for for architects when you're moving to to an agile uh, setup. Um, collaboration, as already said, is is, is very important. Uh, so so one spends much more time in in aligning with others and getting informed on what has happened and, and making sure that everybody is on, on the same page, um, even more than than before than a traditional architect. Uh, but also the the act of architecting uh, might change, right? So, so the fact that we have uh, parallel uh, trains, uh, parallel agile uh, teams that deliver uh, into the same overall uh, system that that creates the the challenge of uh, higher challenges and higher focus on 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 interoperability and, and integration and uh, and necessary. Uh, modularity and componentization of our systems, right? So, so we need to ensure that our our systems are independent to the extent that the different teams can deliver them, but at the same time, um, they fit in as a whole uh, to the system. So, 
so engaging stakeholders uh, and, and engaging actors and stakeholders in, in your work is very important as an architect uh, in an agile setup. Um, in, in our case, due to the fact that we were designing the solution, solution architecture, um, we spent a lot of time in identifying who our stakeholders are, so what kind of actors do we have, um, uh, how to engage them and establishing a, a means of engaging. Uh, for us, it has been very important to, uh, to collect input uh, from, from our stakeholders um, to create a process <clears throat> that the stakeholders would uh, see themselves uh, in, right? So, so a process that, uh, that they would um, see how their input is, um, is used uh, and, and create a transparency around this. Um, it has been very important for us to, uh, to both get uh, involvement, but also get ownership of, of what we are designing. So, uh, so, so the, the, our design was not our design necessarily, but we were facilitators. We were using our knowledge in architecture in order to, to design something that was owned by everybody, to design a common, a common architecture. Uh, in order to support this, it has been very important to have a structure, so, so know how, what are the steps that are happening, so have, have an, an, an overall uh, approach that, that you can see, but also have transparency of what is happening, right? So, so every input that we have gotten, uh, it was essential that it could be identified and, and tracked. So, so you could either see how a specific input has been has, has been uh, included in our architecture, or uh, how, what do we do if it's not, right? So, so in our case, we, we created a, a longer uh, backlog list where we could fit uh, in our, for our next iterations. Um, so, so it has been essential to, uh, to uh, show that, that the architecture was designed uh, because our st stakeholders uh, designed it this way. Um, at the same time, we also documented by potential conflicts, right? So, so what if we get inputs that are different? Um, and we also try to uh, uh, have a set of st uh, stable rules on, on what it is. So, so for example, we identified uh, what kind of areas we're working. So, so if it was a, a business-related uh, input that we would get, then it's the business stakeholders that would have the last word, uh, while if it was a modeling, modeling technical aspect, then it would be some other kind of stakeholders that would have the, the last word of how we should design our models and, and how we should structure our documentation. We don't have a lot of time left, so I'll just briefly go through some of the accelerators and some of the ANSI patterns we see at people actually introducing these Agile concepts. So the accelerators firstly. Automate everything. Make sure that you remove the overhead for teams so that they can uh, get code out quickly. Make sure to uh, test, uh, integrate, deploy everything automatically so you get faster time to market and you get feedback quickly. Then reduce technical debt, especially if you're an organization that's sort of new to Agile and the ways of working. You probably have a lot of systems that's not quite ready for the Agile ways. You have monolithic system design or you have infrastructure that keeps breaking and you need to spend time on that. So invest in reducing your technical debt so that you can become more agile. You cannot build a Formula One racer based on parts from an old cargo ship. So invest in that. Then infrastructure as code. Try to build your infrastructure on code and build it on cloud or similar so that you can spin up environments when needed so that everyone can have the environments, they need to test everything out. It will increase your quality and make sure that teams are not bound by the dependencies of sharing environments. Then full stack telemetry, make sure you measure everything. If you want to do plan, build, measure, learn, then you need to have the measurements in place. And it's not just technical, make sure you have the business value or the end user behavior measured as well. So you can have those things as input for your next plan. And then finally, use microservices and APIs. It, the inter-system dependency, you can really remove that by building your systems like this. And it will help people and in the teams take ownership of their own systems so that they can innovate the architecture within their own little microservice. 
Some of the anti-patterns we see when we go out is that people introduce decision boards. They greatly inhibit flow and we want flow to have a continuous value stream. So don't do architecture boards. Instead, make sure that you as architects go out and collaborate with people. Make sure that you listen to what they do, participate in demos or similar, so that you get a feel for what they're doing and you can coach them in the right direction. We see lack of guidelines. It's great to have autonomy in teams and we want to go in that direction, but they can also go a bit too far. Not having any coherence and uh, strategic vision for the teams, uh, sort of rogue teams just building what they want. So it's a balance as an architect going from no rules to only rules. It needs to be somewhere in between where you have good guidelines for teams so they know where to go, but they still have the autonomy to take decisions themselves. Perfectionism. It really is not about being perfect the first time. That's not possible. So build stuff, learn from it. And if you need to fail, then just make sure that you have the measures in place so that you can recover quickly. Then it doesn't hurt quite as much when you fall. So don't be perfect, but make sure you have the things in place so that you can recover when you do fail. Ceremonial overhead. If you go into Agile and you add, for example, Scrum as a framework, and you just add it on top of the meetings you already have, then suddenly your calendar is filled with only meetings. So it's not about adding the agility uh, ceremonial stuff on top. It's about changing from one process to another. And always ask yourself, why do I have this meeting? Does it provide any value? And finally, the investment bias. Don't consider money spent when you decide what to do forward. If there are changing requirements or your plan isn't the right one anymore, then change the plan. You should pivot without mercy, not thinking what you already used. So don't consider money spent when doing investments. It's not about throwing away good investments. It's about not continuing to put money into bad investments. So a few of the takeaways for today. So we have the role of an architect. It's about alignment, collaboration, making sure that you're there and you understand and you help the teams align on the systems. You don't own the architecture, but you drive the conversation and you make sure that it's on the agenda, on the business side, and that people are collaborating on this. And then it's really about delivering in small parts. Small, good tasting pieces that has high quality and we can learn from that. And then we can build the next iteration, plan the next iteration of our architecture. The architectural runway is about building just enough architecture and about building it just in time. So we want to provide the architecture needed to fulfill the business needs, but we don't want to have too much too early because if the business then changes direction, then we have built a lot of stuff that we don't need. And finally, there's a re always a focus on business needs. Make sure to connect your architecture to the strategy and that you know why you're doing these stuff. Don't build architecture for the sake of architecture. Finally, some of the strate strategies we discussed to involve stakeholders is to participate in the ceremonies they have, the demo or the retrospectives, so that you can help teams understand the direction they need to go and you can understand the direction they're actually going. Take a coaching role. Make sure that you don't tell people what to do, but you sort of help them figure out how to do this. And then finally, the informal meetings are a very good way of doing this. Meeting people at the coffee machine, you can just hang around there, wait till someone's come. And, uh, and eating lunch with people, that's, this really works. It seems simple, but it makes a world of a difference. So that was the presentation we had for you guys. We'll be ready to answer any questions you sent to us. Thank you. So welcome to the studio. We got a lot of questions, so thanks for that. Uh, the first one, I didn't get all the three challenges the external professor identified. That's you, Konstantinos. So can you repeat uh, the three challenges? Yes, definitely, right? So, so <clears throat> if we start from the top, right? So one of them is the uh, discussion of upfront or intentional architecture versus the emerging architecture. So, so if we take, uh, if we live in an environment where our systems evolve in a way that we don't really control, how much can we design upfront 
or the other way around. So in order to give freedom in controlling uh, or, if, or in, in, to give freedom in our systems evolving, what is the minimum amount of architecture we need to do uh, in order to support our evolution of our systems the way that we want? So that was challenge number one, right? And then if we say challenge number two is actually the fact that due to the fact that we are potentially more teams that are working together uh, and have different purposes, so we have different uh, functional qualities, that the functional uh, deliverables that we need to deliver. So, so how do we coordinate of these teams, especially in the unknown setup of evolution, right? So, so how do we make sure that we are aligned uh, all together when we are working in parallel in a, in a set of deliverables? And then challenge number, number three was uh, naturally the fact that uh, when we are working in, uh, in our development, we are working in a short-term perspective. So how do we align with a potential overall strategy? So first of all, how do we set an overall strategy? So a business strategy and an IT strategy after that when we're working in, a, in an agile uh, perspective. And then how do we make sure that our development is actually aligned with the overall strategies that, uh, that we have. So that was the three uh, challenges. Yeah, perfect. Then we have uh, two questions that are sort of the same, but uh, on different sides of the scale. So one is, I doubt the value uh, of the architect role in Agile. How does it fit into emergent architecture? And the other is, uh, they know best. Well, how do you know that the evolving architecture to some degree follows the strategic direction you're trying to achieve? and doesn't accidentally sabotage this direction? I think these are two uh, very good questions, right? So thank you for asking this, first <laughs> of all, right? So, so one of the, the, um, the important questions to answer first, right? So why do we really need architects? If we, if we are agile and we, we can just evolve our systems the way that we want, why do we really want the architects anyway? Um, and one of the reasons is the fact that um, if we have the architects if we have some kind of architects, it doesn't necessarily have to be the architect, we have to have a role that is responsible for having a focus on the coordination across. So if I'm sitting and developing in my own uh, scrum team and, and focused on what I have to deliver right now, uh, it's very hard for me to look at the team next to me on what they're doing and how does this affect a my coding development at the, uh, right now, but also how does it uh, play together as a whole complete system or sy set of systems uh, in, in total? So, so the coordination and, and the uh, uh, interdependency perspective, it has to be covered by someone. And, and that someone typically is the architect because the architects have the uh, competencies of doing that. So, so as an architect, you, you are uh, trained to think how things would fit together. So that, that's one aspect of this, right? And, and I think that's, uh, that's important. And then the second aspect is that if we look at the, as we mentioned, the challenge number three, so if we look at the third challenge, um, there is a lot of mental effort that needs to be spent. And it's actually uh, of important focus that we align where, how we develop. So where does our development go in, in align with where do we want to go as an organization, as a business and potentially as an IT strategy, right? So, so looking at how do we map these two? So how do we make sure that, the, that what we develop now, although it is uh, very much emerging architecture and much, very much depending on the iterations of, of that we negotiate on each sprint or, or in, in the beginning of each iteration, it actually fits together a little bit in the overall uh, roadmap that we have. And how do we make that a little bit more practical? That's a, that's an interesting question, right? So, so if we look at the safe uh, setup, and I know now that we're we are talking about overall agile, but if we start with a safe setup, uh, we have different layers of architecture. So, so we have the enterprise architect that looks at how the organization fits together uh, as a whole, right? So it looks at what is our overall strategy, what is our uh, overall in intention, and, and what is the vision for the organization, and designs an enterprise architecture. And that is translated over by a solution architect into how do we create the structure or the frame of, uh, of the different release trains would come into play. Uh, and then we have the solution, sorry, the, the um, train architects um, where they come in and, and implement uh, part of the structures that they get across. Um, so SAFE has a little bit more of a structure approach to ensure 
an alignment across the uh, governance, uh, sorry, the, um, <clears throat> the, the strategy at one level and the implementation, but not all of the agile implementations have that. So if we are running pure Scrum, then we need to make sure that we take these uh, concerns in. Either we do it by having strategic actors, right? So putting strategic stakeholders that represent the strategy in, or having some of our architects or some other roles that take more of a strategic interesting view into this to ensure that we bring the strategic perspective into our uh, implementation, into our uh, uh, solution architecture uh, design. Yeah, so, yep. so just to reiterate, one of the anti-patterns we see is that we have no guidelines. So it's about finding a balance between having teams that can do exactly what they want and then teams that sort of have guidelines uh, going to where they need. So having that direction is important. And I think it's from the lean that uh, a little planning can really remove a lot of waste. So I think we have just uh, time for one last question. So I'm just looking here. So what tools do you find most useful in communicating agile architecture to stakeholders and teams? Very briefly. Um, so can you say it again, sorry? So what, what tools do you find most useful in communicating to stakeholders? Yeah, okay, so, uh, so that really depends, right? Depends on the maturity of the organization. So, so if we are an organization, if we're dealing with an organization that is moduling mature, so using models is actually a very good idea. Uh, so, so trying to model things is effective. But the disadvantage of many of the models is that they are too technical for the abstract uh, stakeholders or the management, uh, and they are not technical enough for the uh, developers. So you cannot make code out of this. So many times it's much easier to describe things in simple box and lines as long as you always explain what it is, right? So, so uh, you try to uh, explain what you're drawing, putting legend, for example, is always a good idea. Um, and then there is, uh, so the communication, you can formalize it, and that's an important aspect, but it also happens, as we already said, uh, in, a, in very informal ways, right? So, so the, the lunch or the coffee talk is actually a, a good approach in, into doing this. Yeah, and I think if you need some tools for the management side, then Jira or Azure DevOps can really help spot these dependencies and you have it uh, communicated in that sense that the teams can use it, but you also have the stakeholders can go in and see what you're working on. So I think that's what time we had. Yeah. Thank you for listening. Have a nice day.